Hello, everybody, and welcome to our uh, Off the Church Tea Time. Before we begin, I'd like to just introduce myself and ask the rest of the team to introduce themselves. I'm Granville Campbell. I'm Kanisha Castillo. I'm Niana. Thank you guys for joining us for, and for being here today. So our topic today is going to center around the sermon from Lorenzo and Alexandra on giving and receiving help. And one of the things that I think probably stood out for me quite a bit was, the, the, you know, the, the sense of how that energy flows. And I think the biggest standout was just where Lorenzo shared that where we don't know somebody's intention and we give help, we're actually helping them to reaffirm their choice, which is not actually a loving way of giving help. So that was one of the things that primarily stood out for me um, right now. Uh, I've watched the sermon a couple of times, having done the intro, and something different stands out for me every time. But that was like kind of the big point for me, it was like, the intention with people asking for help. And then what, what place are they asking from? And if you, know, if you don't know that they're asking from a place of love, you're affirming or allowing them to reaffirm their choice. So I kind of want to put that out there and see how you guys feel about that point. Yeah, I think... Um... As a mom, this is something that's been very, uh, for me to be able to get clear on as like, are they asking help because they just want me to do it for them? Um, or if, like fix the problem for them? Or are they asking help because they really need guidance in this space? Um, and so being able to get really clear on that energy has allowed me to be able to not exert so much energy and to allow them to be able to grow and really uh, be self-sufficient on their own. Um, but it's, it's really having to look at the feeling behind it. Does, and for me, it's really like, does it feel heavy to help them in this space? And if so, why does it feel heavy? And then is it okay to move forward from here? Um, or is it something that they really have to look at and, and take on as their own? But um, that is also something that I really do uh, make sure that I let my kids know like if you if you need help here you need to speak up because I can't read your mind and it's actually okay to ask for help because sometimes we just don't know things and we're always learning we're always growing and evolving um, but then when it comes to like the adults in my life <laughs> there are a lot of people that I've had to put strong boundaries up because um, it's more of like well if I just ask for help then I actually don't have to do it and as I've gotten really clear on that kind of energy, I came to the realization that I was actually doing them a disservice by not allowing them to step up and make a new choice here and really look at why they have this reoccurring pattern. Um, but then also like kindly and gently like point out this pattern and remind them of their power and their divinity. And so it's always, um, I'm either like giving and as in like teaching and guiding them or I'm receiving and learning how to step back and really allow them to step up in their energy and uh, claim their good. But uh, one of the things that they touched on that really, I was just like, wow, that makes a lot of sense is uh, when Alexandra talked about how we grew up learning that it's not always okay to ask for help and that it is a sign of weakness. And that was something that I always felt like, okay, if I ask for help, then that means that I'm not doing something right or that um, there was just like kind of this level of like not being able to believe in myself if I had to ask for help, like I had to do it all by myself. Um, but that became, like she said, very lonely, very um, just feeling like, I was never getting on top because I was always trying to uh, do things by myself. But as soon as I released that pattern and really chose to embrace the help that God was giving me, not realizing that when people asked to 
help me in certain ways, that was God moving through that person. And so I would sometimes feel guilty about receiving that help, not realizing that I asked God for help and then he moved through someone to give it to me. And so I was learning how to receive. <laughs> so um, yeah, that's kind of like my intake on that. And just uh, a lot of things that I had to really sit with during the sermon. And I, I definitely think I'm gonna go back and rewatch it. Cause there's, like you said, there's always kind of a, a new tidbit the next time you watch and you're like, oh yeah, I see where I still do that. And I can make a change here. <laughs> Yeah, what I got from that point is that with the attention, uh, what came up is for me is someone, if someone has a certain idea how they want to have help, like this certain image, I want it this way, not any other way, and the person gets upset, if you have to help them, actually help them in another way, then, you, then, you, then they reveal themselves too, and it's sometimes difficult, but you can... I feel, yeah, yeah that's also a learning process to just try it, to see how it feels and how a person reacts and um, receives it or not. And, and I, I, yeah, I loved to mention that if you help someone and the person actually grows and go through their challenge, then you see that they actually have the intention to, yeah, receive help for, yeah, the, to grow and, yeah, that was very helpful to me to see that and not just from a place of, okay, I give you this and uh, from the COVID band place, but you had to help them grow and move forward. Yeah, and I, you know, I think what both of you have mentioned is quite important as well, because one of the things that kind of stood out for me in my life is am I getting in the way of somebody learning their lesson if I help them? And, you know, I, I, unfortunately, the fact is that nobody in the history of learning lessons has ever learned their lesson by learning somebody else's lesson. You know, it's, you know, it's one of those weird things. Like in the history of learning lessons, you have never learned your lesson from helping, from learning somebody else's lesson. It's specific to you. And so I, I know that we are very geared by society and just the way we grow up to want to help. It's almost, I feel like it's almost a natural disposition unless you're a little bit narcissistic and psychotic and all those other weird and wonderful things that we tend to term people. But the fact is there's almost this, there's almost a very genetic disposition to want to help people. But I've also found that in that space of being predisposed to helping people, you also tend to come across people that are predisposed to taking advantage of your help. So I like what, you know, I just, I, I, I liked how the sermon just brought all these things together in the sense that, you know, ask God, how do you want me to help this person? Because you are loving that, you are loving that person, or God is loving that person through you, as you said, Kanisha. So, you know, it's, it's, it's that sense of, well, then, how do I love this person? How do I help that person? And again, that energy of, well, actually, the most loving thing to do is to say no. Or the most loving thing to do is to put up that boundary. And as you said, Leanna, there's a minute. They, the minute you see the reaction, you understand the place from which they're operating. So it kind of takes you, it, it requires us to be quite aware in that space of giving and receiving help. It takes us the energy of being quite discerning. And I want to draw the distinction between discernment and judgment. Because sometimes we think we're being judgmental because we are predisposed to helping but we're actually just being very discerning to understand that actually this does not feel right. 
And I feel like I've grown up with that feeling of it doesn't feel right. But am I, what, how am I going to look if I say no? How is that person going to feel if I say no? What's going to happen if I say no? And I want to bring it back to my comment. Am I getting in the way of learning their lesson? Of them learning the lesson? Am I trying to learn their lesson for them? I know there's a lesson for me. But there's also the, the, fact, the counter argument that there's a lesson for them. And am I actually getting in the way of it? Yeah, I love that you bring that up. That's something that I've been healing, um, especially within my family, within uh, my, my relationship with my brother. Uh, growing up, I, was, I always had this motherly energy and vibe always wanted to take care of my siblings and protect them and so when they would do something that I know would get them in trouble and I just hated seeing them in trouble I didn't like seeing them get uh at the time I thought it was punished but now I'm understanding it's disciplined the discernment between punishment and discipline um I would actually take the blame for what they did so that they wouldn't get punished or hurt like I would rather take that and that was kind of the um like savior complex that I'm also healing at the root um but I realized by doing that and instead of them learning their lesson uh it really prohibited them prohibited them to take full responsibility of all of their actions and as adults uh, they're having to relearn <laughs> that you actually have to take full responsibility of all the things that you do here. Like big sister is not going to be able to take care of you anymore. Um, and so when I look back on that, I realized that I thought I was helping, but really, really like I was hindering their growth and their, pro their progress. So I had to one, forgive myself because I didn't know any better. I just thought that I was protecting and being loving. Um, but to really understanding that uh, there was a lot of things that I took on as a child that I didn't have to do to trying to learn the lessons for others or per not even really prevent them from learning their lessons, just thinking I was protecting them. Um, but I've really gotten clear now on how to uh, redirect that energy into <laughs> I can hold space for you as you move through this um, and I'm here to support you however I'm not here to take on the the backlash or the contrast that's coming from your lesson yeah I, th I think you mentioned something quite important because in that space, of the backlash of the contrast. Like I, I, don't, I don't believe that any of us are little, like, you know, we, 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 we don't intentionally choose to live in contrast, but we do make choices that highlights the con contrast at a, sometimes at a very small level and sometimes at a very high level. And though that contrast comes in the form of consequences. And so as we learn through those consequences, we learn our lessons. And we kind of get to the point where we're like, okay, I don't want to feel like that anymore. You know, I don't want to feel that. And so we learn the lesson because it's literally the fact of, well, the contrast is showing me what I don't want. So what do I want? And we learn that way. We learn that, hey, this wasn't such a smart plan. <laughs> hey, this wasn't such a good feeling. Hey, actually, that didn't work out so well. And yes, as you said, we, we, we kind of did it. We did the best that we knew how to do at that point. So it's kind of okay. You know, like I, you know, I was going through this and I was like, well, actually, you know, there are things that have happened and they kind of served their purpose. And I just listened to the word served. It kind of feels like, Hey, it's done. It's served its purpose. It's not serving a purpose. And it feels like a much healthier space to be in. Be in. And then that, that, you know, and just even realizing that it's like, hey, I'm actually helping myself move forward. I'm helping myself move along. I'm helping myself release things. And I think that's kind of the thing that stood out for me with 
a component of what Alexandra said in terms of you also need to be able to actually help yourself. And also what Lorenzo shared in like, you need to have those conversations with yourself. Like you need to be, be it, become clear. You need to obtain that clarity to understand why it is that you're actually wanting this help or needing this help. What purpose is it gonna serve? Is there value in it? All those other things. So I, I, I just feel like this, the sermon was quite, quite nice. And just like, you know, it like just drilled to the core. And in very comfortable, easy, understandable terms. Yeah, that, that part stood out to me too, that uh, getting clear on why you want help and how or, or for what. Um, yeah, to demand it from God, to, yeah, I want this help so I can do this and, and be more detailed, like this conversation with God, right? And I've been experiencing that too because I felt like oh I need this but I was like not not very clear why or for what and at the moment when I was clear oh I need it for this and this and this is how yeah how it's useful then I received it and yeah that's very well very well to for me to continue with that to yeah communicate with God um, what I need Yeah, I think that's something that I'm really learning myself is how important it is to um, like before I would I would go ask a person for help instead of going in and doing my inner work and then letting God guide me to either where my where to go get my help or whoever was going to come through for that help. Um, the more that I've done that, the more just easier and lighter it feels and the quicker the help moves through <laughs> the faster the results which has been really wonderful um especially when it comes to like finances sometimes as i'm moving through finances um i would before like go to my parents like i'm low here or i need money here type thing and now i just strictly go to god and i tell him exactly what i need and I will sometimes like lay my bills out and be like, this is my bills. This is what the world wants from me, God. <laughs> I need your help to like cover this. I don't know where it's coming from, but I need you to take care of me here. Um, and within even just moments after that, I'm getting ideas or ways to really move forward into receiving that help. Um, and in return, when I do that, it seems like I'm also helping that person at the same time and whatever it may be, um, whether it's ascension coaching or um, just providing service in some type of way. And so there's always an equal give and take in that space. I find that if I do it without going to God first, it feels like I'm just taking. And that's something I've had to really get clear on that energy um, and really understand that it's always God that you have to go to first and then he will move mountains and part seas <laughs> to provide for you what you need. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's just really getting clear on just going to him and then allowing him to move through whoever he needs to move through. Yeah, and I, I think you've touched on something quite important in, and that, that came through in the sermon as well, was just that, you know, that energy of where you help people and they start to regard you as their source, or you get help and you potentially start to regard that person as your source. And so I feel like Alexandra and Lorenzo kind of just also unpacked that quite a bit in the year and in, just in terms of clarifying that your source is not that person or this that situation or that thing and you know it's kind of it's it's quite relieving because it doesn't for me like you know when you see something outside of yourself as being your source it kind of that energy of dependency that they were talking about and that dependency doesn't feel comfortable and the reason why it doesn't feel comfortable because is because it can be taken away at any time 
It's not safe. It's not secure. It's not comfortable. And it really has you spinning your wheels. <laughs> like, I, like, like, I feel like the components come together nicely. And as you unpack it, you just like realize how much truth there is in just being clear but what these things actually are and what they mean. And I, I often find that as I heal something, like I start to really understand almost the meaning behind the emotion as opposed to just understanding the meaning of the word. Like the clarity becomes deeper. Like knowing what it is, feels like to be compassionate to other people is one thing, but it's a completely different thing when you realize what it actually means to be compassionate to yourself. It's like, a, it, it, it's literally like the depth of that word takes on a whole new understanding, takes on a whole new meaning. It allows a deeper grounding of the core energy. It's like, it almost feels like two different words once you understand it from the perspective of having applied to yourself. Yeah, this reminds me of, um, as Alexander said, about giving help all the time, like putting other people first. And, and that this is a whole different feeling than if you. Yeah, just give help, give to yourself. Um, and I have this too. I often forget, completely forget myself and put everyone around me first. And, and it feels just really bad. And in that way, you can't really see uh, what's, uh, yeah, how you can help someone or how someone is asking for you for your help because you're basically project, projecting what you need yourself into other people. and. You become dependent on other people to help them for yourself in that way. Yeah. Yeah, and I have to, you know, I have to agree with you that the, the feeling isn't great. It's 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 really not a great feeling. But it kind of requires a little bit of personal courage. You know, like it, it, it requires quite a bit of personal courage to actually help yourself by even just exploring your feelings and by even just healing the upset. You know, like, I, you know, the, 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 and the feeling for me is there's a lot of components of life where we, where we tend to project onto the outside world and the outside world projects onto us. And we tend to kind of assimilate those things very simply and very easily and very naturally. It almost becomes this energy of a way of life. Like we don't actually understand <laughs> that we are imprinting or have been imprinted on in ways that are probably not healthy for us. And so one of the things that we pick up is this thing that it sounds or is said to be bad to put yourself first. And I grew up with that, probably having learned some unusual lessons in school, at home, is that, you know, that energy of putting others before myself. And so... My journey has been kind of to under, unpack what does what does it actually mean to put yourself first? And if you are putting yourself first, does it mean you're putting your, you are putting other people last? And it's just like, well, actually, no. You know, like actually, if everybody puts themselves first in a healthy way, I'm not responsible for their choice of whether they put themselves first or not. And the, the fact is, putting myself first in a healthy way is for my highest good kind of energy, you know? So, like, for my highest good, it wouldn't be good to shoot somebody. But for my highest good, it would be good not to have certain relationships with people. That requires a boundary. 
And so for my highest good, it's okay to honor that boundary. It's okay to say no. And sometimes for their highest good, it's okay to say no. In fact, it's the only thing that you can do. Like when you really understand the energy of the situation, you look at it and you go, well, if I continue saying yes, what do they get from it? And it's the thing that Alexandra and, Alexa, uh, and, and Lorenzo shared about, are they actually growing? Are they choosing to grow? Do you see growth? And I can, you know, I can comfortably say that 50% of the time throughout my journey of 44 years, <laughs> there was no growth. Just like receive, sorted. Come back for more, sorted. Come back for more, sorted. And I was like, you know, I was subscribing to this energy of, well, actually, I'm in a more fortunate position, so I should. And no, actually, I shouldn't. Because it gets to the point where when you do eventually put up that boundary, you just realize that there is no relationship. There's actually nothing there. It's like, oh, what was I doing? <laughs> Like, why didn't I see it before? <laughs> you know, and I have to, I have to laugh because sometimes I just have these hilarious moments where I go like, oh, that was, that's, that, that's kind of an empty shell of a relationship. You know, and it's not even the empty shell. It's literally like when you cook beans and you find the husk and the bean comes out and the husk remains behind. <laughs> it's kind of an husk of a relationship. <laughs> Yeah, um, that was something that I had to really move through, of, especially being a mom, feeling like I had to always take care of my children before myself. Um, and something that I had to really learn after starting to like work a nine to five job was like after picking them up from school and getting home and trying to go straight into like dinner and homework and all of that stuff. And by the time eight at 30, nine o'clock roll around, I was burnt out. And so Jeff and Shalee always talk about how sometimes we have to refill our cups two, three times a day <laughs> just to get through the day. And so I had to set a boundary with my children that as soon as we got home, they would ask for like snacks and all these questions and all these things. And I'm just trying to get through the door. And, <laughs> and like I finally set a boundary and I'd let them know like, mommy needs to take care of herself for a few minutes every time we get home like I just need to go change I want to do the mirror exercise fill my cup give myself what I need and the first two or three days was a little like rough they're like but we're hungry we want this we want that and I just explained to them like you are old enough to go check out the pantry if there's something you see and you're able to grab it grab it um, and I want to say within the next week we got into the house and my youngest started to ask for things. And my oldest goes, whoa, whoa, give mommy a few minutes. And after she gets, her, gets herself together, she'll come out and make us dinner. We can get a, self, a snack. And I was like, ah, we're growing. We're learning. <laughs> They're capturing what I'm, what I'm giving them here. <laughs> like, fantastic. And so now coming home is so much more smoother. We have a routine. They know that mommy needs to go change and decompress, fill up her cup, and then she'll come out and take care of the rest of what we need done. And then come eight o'clock, I feel, I feel good. I still feel rested. And then I'm going to bed peacefully instead of feeling like I drowned in my day. <laughs> so um, it's, it's really me learning how to take care of myself, but them also learning she has to take care of her before she can fully like continue to take care of us. And I think they've seen the contrast of what it's like when mommy doesn't take care of herself and then tries to take care of us over when she takes care of her and then takes care of us. And it's a much more peaceful uh, space in the home. And it's, it's, it's really beautiful. It's just, it's relieving. <laughs> it's definitely relieving.
I also think something that you're doing is that's quite healthy is that you're teaching them how to have a relationship with themselves and then with other people. Because I don't like, like when you share that, and I think back, I'm like, I never learned that. I don't know. I don't know how my life would have been different if I had learned that. But the fact is, it's kind of these, it's, you know, those poles of wisdom that you kind of remember from your parents and you're like, oh, it makes sense now. And something that I read a while ago, and it, it's going to sound really bizarre, but just listen to what it says. It says that if you continuously give, people fall in love with your hand as opposed to falling in love with you. I was like, hmm, well, that's a little bit interesting. You know, like you can just imagine that that could be something that an old grandma would say to you at some point in your life. You'd be like, what do you mean? Until you actually discover it and you realize that actually, but that's the truth. They fall in love with the energy of taking. And so you fall in love with the energy of giving because you feel validated by giving because they're receiving and they enjoy receiving. But when you take the step back and you go, well, how many times have I actually given from an empty cup? You kind of have to sit back and go, well, actually, it makes sense when somebody then turns around and says, well, actually, if you give too much, somebody falls in love with your hand as opposed to you. And the fact is, there is no way that I have learned that says you have to give in order to love. But I do have the sense that where it is appropriate and where it is reasonable and where it is helpful, it is helpful to help. <laughs> you know, like that mother goose thing. <laughs> but you know, like I just I feel like it just becomes so much more clear all the time as we go deeper that sometimes we need the simplicity of the message. And the simplicity of the message sinks in so much more and uncomplicates so much more. But again, it's about being open to receiving that help through the message. And like what you said about falling in love with feeling good with giving help uh, or like giving one place of uh, that someone else wants to take. Sometimes it feels good, but yeah, it's really important to go deeper than only that service level good feeling. So you get to feel like if you actually yeah want to love that person or just only for that good feeling of being appreciated or uh, uh, reactions like oh yeah yeah positive reactions because you're feeling just feeling uh, emptiness and then you can go back and do it again and again and again and not move forward and that's just uh, and it's not actually really helping. Yeah, and I think the importance there is recognizing that when we try to uh, give from a place like that, that's where the resentment is created, is a lot of that it starts to build in that space because we are not always giving from a place of love. We might think it's a place from love, but really having to fill into that intention. Is it because I deeply want to love in this space or is it because I think I'm going to get something out of it in this space. What is this energy? Um, and then also doing it from a place of um, just pure intentions, true intentions, and understanding that uh, when we give from an empty cup, that resentment builds because we feel, 
I guess, like, uh, shorted in some end because you didn't give to yourself first and really provide for yourself in that way and take care of yourself first and then moved through the guidance of being able to give in that space. And so that's something that I've really had to get clear on of why I was having resentment build up in certain relationships. And it was because I wasn't giving to myself and then giving into this relationship, or I was um, not putting up healthy boundaries and they were just taking. And it's because that's what I allowed. I had to recognize that like, if I wanted that to change, I had to be the change. That's something I'm really um, deepening every day is I'm fully responsible of my reality. And so if someone continues to show up in a space a certain way, it's because I'm allowing it somewhere within myself and I have to be fully responsible instead of like pointing fingers. It's like, oh, well, <laughs> it's really me. So <laughs> I have to uh, look at this space, space and make a choice to heal it here or continue to be taken from and uh, build resentment in that relationship. So I think you've touched on something quite important in, this, in that growing resentment. Because I think one of the things that probably fuels it more than anything else is when you give from a place of obligation. So it's almost that place where you almost feel like you don't have a choice. And I, I'm sharing this because I have been there. Like I, I've, I've felt this thing where it's like, well, if I don't do it, it's not going to happen. Well, if I don't give, they're not going to survive. And I was like, literally putting myself in that space of a savior. And when I look back on it and I feel into it, it was literally out of obligation. It wasn't because I, lit I chose to love. You know, and it's, it's kind of that sense. And something somebody shared with me ages ago was like, if somebody asked to lend money or borrow money from me, I don't, I never do it. But if I have money to give them, I give it to them. And I was like, well, what is that thing? And the thing is, sometimes we actually operate from the space of we help in the expectation that we will be helped in return. And then that help doesn't show up from those people that we've helped in the way that we think it's going to show up and we become resentful. And so all of these things fuel almost these petals of resentment that is just like a, it's just literally a dying rose. It's like a black rose dying because you're putting petals in there and the petals are not actually blooming. Nothing is blooming. It's just a blooming mess. That's really what it is. And you know, so it kind of just, it takes me into the space of like, actually just sit back. Why am I doing this? Why do I want to do this? And it doesn't matter how dire the situation is anymore. The fact is how and why, why am I doing this? And how am I going to do this? And literally, should I be doing this? And I feel like, you know, having us going through Jeff and Shalia's teachings and coaching has just allowed, has kind of just allowed us to be very much more clear, not only about who we are, but also about how we show up and what action we take and what choices we make in taking those actions. Because you kind of need to be very clear about the choice in order to take the action. And then also understand that you shouldn't be expecting anything in return from that action. And it's, it's for me, it's balanced my energy quite a bit because I'm much more comfortable to say, let me think about it. But also understand that this is not me thinking about it because I'm automatically going to say yes. I'm thinking about it because I need to understand if it feels good to do it. Because if it doesn't feel good, I don't do it. It's literally the energy of, if it's not an immediate yes, it's probably a no. But I need to kind of understand why that no showed up. So I need to understand what am I actually feeling in this space that is leading me to believe that it's actually a no. 
because it kind of needs to be a, a comfortable yes. It needs to be an, a yes, like, you know, like, this is a no brainer kind of yes. So yeah, I mean, you know, that's, that's the space I'm in at the moment. I'm doing this training at work and they're talking about like how people become millionaires and uh, where their time goes or energy goes. And you're going to learn that we learn this in life LPC of like where you're really focusing your energy and making sure that you're saying no to like the little mundane things and the tasks that actually don't serve you. And one of the things that he said is that it's not a hell yes, it's a no. And I was like, Absolutely. yes, I can do that. <laughs> that is very easy for me. <laughs> and so then I don't have to spend energy figuring out like, am I, do I really want to say no? Like, like it's, if it's not a hell yes, it's a no, don't even bother. Like just keep moving forward. And then that way we're able to really filter out what is really for us and really what's not. Cause at the core, like the answer is within us, we already know. We and so know. it's a lot of the time it's ego trying to play that guilt game or like maybe you should give that a try even though a part of you is really like I really don't want to but out of obligation or don't wanting to tell someone no you figure out how to kind of like move through that but no if it's not a hell yes we're moving on <laughs> <laughs> I like that if it's not a hell yes it's a, it's a no and it's literally that energy of a of, and and I don't know if you guys have come across the concept of a whole body yes it's like your mind your body and your heart are all in the same space. And you're just like, I'm ready. I'm ready to do this. I'm ready to go. I'm here ready to say yes. And if none of those things are there, there's no point. There really is no point. It's like that energy of a whole body yes versus a partial yes. A partial yes is a no. Yeah, that's very useful. I've been in a place a lot that I was doubting, okay, I don't know. And then I was trying and every time I came back to, okay, I actually didn't want to do this and I wasted, yeah, energy. So it's really useful thing. Okay, maybe, okay, probably no. And then just move on. Feels very good. Yeah, it does feel good. And, and, and I think that the, the reason why it feels good is because there's no energy leak. Your energy is very much contained and aligned. And it's like, yes, versus um, 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 um is a waste of energy. It's literally drawing components of your energy. And so, and, and that's what I'm saying, you know, like, I, I just love it that if it's not an immediate yes for me, it's in all likelihood a no. And so the only thing I need to sit with is to be comfortable with my decision and my choice. And that's a learning, that's, a, that's, the, that's the, a path of learning for us as we mature in our lives, in our spiritual practice, in our relationships with everybody. And it's okay. It's actually okay to take our time with it. That's how we help ourselves. We don't put ourselves under the obligation of it must be this way immediately. Yes, I made the choice, but I can allow the choice to ground in. And when I'm ready to take the action step, I will be ready to take the action step and I'll take the action step. And I think that's something else that just stood out for me in Larian John Alexander's sermon is just, there is an action after your choice to help or not help. There's an action in your choice after you receive help. When you call in the help and the help shows up and then you, you kind of need to be principled and disciplined enough to use the help for the thing that you called in. You know, and I'm speaking to the example they shared about life purpose, well, twin friends, ascension school classes and things like that. Like you're calling in the help and then you receive the help. Don't squander the help. Like it's kind of, it's literally to me is, not only a slap in your own face, it's a slap in God's face. Like I called in the help, I got clear, I did the work and now I'm squandering the help. And from a personal perspective, if somebody squandered my help, why the hell would I want to help them again? It's very true. That's, that's, that's I think something that as uh, the community is working through um, because I've had 
quite a few people just as I talk through the community and they're moving through an upset and I'm like did you did you watch a class did you were you guided to a class and they're like well I just can't get through it and I'm just like well that is where your help is (laughs) that is probably where your next step is is getting through that class because whatever block you're having if you're not moving through the class I guarantee that's the same block in that class so um but it does surprise me with those who have invested in the work and then um, because it wasn't like an instant gratification and like all of a sudden their twin flame isn't like down on one knee and knocking down their door like they're, they're like this doesn't work or whatever it is it's why persistence and commitment is so important why it's one two of the eight keys of a, a foundation of harmonious union and that is you ask god how do I come into harmonious union with my twin flame? He brought you two beautiful people to give you that work. And then you kind of look at it like, do you have something else? Is there anything else on the menu? Like, <laughs> no, <laughs> like, this is it. And either you can fully receive it and um, really integrate it and then share it. Um, or you can stay in the same place that you're at. So <laughs> uh, that's my, my take on that. <laughs> I like that and I'm laughing because you know it's like you're cooking a meal and then you present this meal and they're like did you make something else uh no this is the meal if you don't want it go find your go cook your own meal you know <laughs> so yeah I, I think it, it's very good for us to also just be clear that you know sometimes that help shows up and we need to be very we, we need to be clear that we called in the help but we also need to be clear about appropriately using the help and then Apart from all of that is actually appreciating the help, like, and appreciating yourself for calling in that help. So yeah, you know, there's a, there's a lot of components and I feel like we could probably go on quite a while about this topic, but I'm just going to ask both of you if you have any last thoughts before we wrap up today. Okay, cool. So thank you for the conversation. Thank you for being here. Thank you to everybody who's joined us today. Please also like, please, please also feel free to like and subscribe to our Church of Union YouTube channel where you will find all our previous after church tea times and our sermons and any other live conversations that have happened in our Unionism Spiritual Discussion group on Facebook. And we will see all of you soon. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.